Okay, good evening. C can you all hear me? Yes. Great, okay. I think we could probably do this talk in Persian. Um, I, 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 I just want to start, first of all, um, by thanking um, uh, Professor Abbas Milani um, and his colleagues uh, here at Stanford for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be, this is my second time here at um, uh, Stanford and it's, uh, you have to understand coming from a British university campus in the age of austerity to Stanford is quite an experience. You know, we, do, we don't have golf carts driving us around uh, our campus. Um, so it, it's, it's, it really is a pleasure. I've, I've been here I'm here for the week, uh, also doing some research in the Hoover Archive uh, for this project in the um, amazing new uh, collection, the Zahidi Papers, that have been opened thanks to the hard work of um, Professor Milani and his colleagues. Um, and I just want to highly recommend that to any of you who are interested in modern history of Iran. It really is probably the most important collection that's been opened, um, uh, certainly in the time that I've been working on this subject. Um, so. My topic for tonight uh, is uh, the question of human rights and human rights activism uh, and the origins of the um, Iranian Revolution. And um, I came to this topic in a sort of roundabout way. I, 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 I was, my background is in the history of um, the relationship between the United States and Iran. And, uh, I wrote my first book really as largely as a sort of traditional diplomatic history of that relationship, focusing mainly on political, military, and intelligence issues in the relationship between the U.S. and Iran, particularly in the 1970s, in the, in the era of Richard Nixon and, and Henry Kissinger. And uh, as time went on, I became more and more interested in the social history of the relationship in that, in that period. Um, that is the relationship between ordinary people, between Americans and, and, and the Iranians. And, and of course, if you're talking about the 1970s, you're talking about a period of intense political activism on the part of many Iranians. Um, and I was very interested in how what many historians call the human rights revolution of the 1970s, this mushrooming of human rights activism in Europe and the United States, how did that did that play any role in the origins of the Iranian Revolution? I mean, is it just an accident of history that the Iranian Revolution happens at the end of the 1970s? Um, what's the relationship between those two things? And um, surprisingly, very few people work on this. Um, most of us who are Iranians and historians of modern Iran, we just study Iran. And Iran's in a hermetically sealed box, you know. Um, and then, uh, my colleagues, who are sort of um, what you would call international historians, tend to focus on the United States and Europe. Um, and so there's very little work that tends to kind of transcend this border. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to do is to sort of break down these walls. I'm trying to internationalize the history of the Iranian Revolution. I'm trying to encourage people to think of the Iranian Revolution as something that didn't just happen in Tehran but actually something that happened here in Northern California, that happened in Berlin, that happened in Najaf, that happened in Leipzig, that happened in, I don't know, Cuba, I mean, you name it. Um, there's very few parts of the world where you can't find people contesting the Iranian Revolution in the 1970s. And so I think what it n really needs is an international history to complement the really excellent work that already exists on what happened in Tehran in 1978. Um, 79. So that's, that's my kind of agenda um, uh, in doing this work. And, um, you know, as a historian, all historians are revisionists, okay, because otherwise we'd have nothing to say, okay. So we, we, all, <laughs> we all have to disagree with those who came before. Um, that's very hard to do in, in my position because, you know, the people who came before me are really quite excellent scholars. Um, and I don't disagree with, my <laughs> with much of what they've said. So the best I can do is to try to um, complement it. There is a, a popular, I would say a po not a scholarly, but a popular narrative uh, about the Iranian Revolution. And that popular narrative goes 
um, something like this. Um, the Shah was a brutal uh, pro-American Cold War autocrat. Um, he was an American puppet uh, who held on to power until um, Jimmy Carter was elected president. Um, Jimmy Carter placed a lot of emphasis on human rights. This undermined uh, the Shah's regime. Um, and this basically forced the Shah to make certain concessions to the opposition, um, which then began the whole process of the, um, set in motion basically, the whole process of the Iranian Revolution. Um, and in this kind of popular narrative, uh, the, the Iranian Revolution is sort of imagined as a, a revolution for rights. So it's a revolution by a group of people demanding their rights, uh, against a dictator denying them their rights. That's, that's the kind of um, uh, narrative. But then at the very last moment, or, le or let's say in, in, in 1978, 1980, that in the, so this popular narrative says, that revolution was hijacked. It was hijacked by um, Islamists who then establish the Islamic Republic, which then perpetu perpetuates the same rights abuses um, as the Shah's regime. So, such is the kind of um, pop popular narrative. I want to sort of deconstruct this. I want to question this narrative um, uh, and ask, you know, was the Iranian revolution really a revolution for rights? Is that really what it, what it was about? Maybe we've come to remember it in that way, but, but did at the time, in the 1970s, did people think of it in that way, the, the people that fought the revolution? Um, the argument um, that I'm going to make is that the human rights revolution of the 1970s uh, was profoundly damaging for the Shah's regime, that human rights, the issue of human rights was instrumentalized as a weapon by the Iranian opposition to use against the Shah's regime. Um, I'm going to argue that, and this, this is really the part that I find the most interesting, I'm going to argue that the Shah himself was acutely sensitive to this human rights um, uh, criticism. And here's my novel argument. Why? Why is he so acutely sensitive to this criticism? Because I argue um, he saw Iran in his language as a great civilization, tamadun e right? And he imagined Iran, in other words, as a civilized country, and that the official narrative of the Pahlavi state, um, what, you know, the, the ideological agenda of the Pahlavi state was to project that image of Iran to Iranians and to the world. And that the human rights criticism undermined that narrative of Iran as a civilized country. So we're gonna, I'm gonna try and unpack this very problematic notion of civilized, what does that mean? Who gets to define what's, what does civilized mean? Um, certainly, Jimmy Carter's election in 1976 was very important and influential um, in convincing the Shah to address the issue of human rights. But I don't believe that the Iranian opposition's embrace of human rights um, uh, was in any way sincere. I think it was purely instrumental. And I think that the opposition to the Shah uh, had just as little uh, sort of uh, just as little concern for human rights as the, uh, you know in any sincere form or shape as the Shah's regime did. In other words, both the Pahlavi state and its opponents are fundamentally illiberal, and neither one of them sincerely embraced the notion of, of liberal human rights. Rather, both are trying to use a rights-based narrative, a rights-based discourse, to pursue certain political objectives. One, to project an image of, you know, for the state, to project an image of a powerful uh, Iran, that uh, a renaissance, you know, a Persian renaissance, a return of Iran as a great power. And the other, to project themselves as the sort of heroic defenders of human rights in the face of the um, uh, oppression of the, of the Shah's regime. So, in other words, the Iranian revolution was not a revolution for rights. I'm actually going to argue that it was fundamentally a revolution, uh, an anti-imperial revolution. It's a revolution founded more or less on the ideology of anti-imperialism, more, more than anything else. 
um, and in that sense wasn't actually that different to much of the anti-imperial movements of the 1970s. Um, so if we take Iran out of its hermetically sealed box and we actually think of what was going on, how the Iranian revolution was being fought in the 1970s, if we think of it as part of the global history of the 1970s, we can say that although there are some aspects of the revolution that are unique to Iran, um, it is actually an artifact of the 1970s. It is a product of the same forces that are shaping many other movements across the world um, uh, in the 1970s. So that's, this is my argument. So um, in terms of, for those, of, I don't know if any of you are graduate students, or if, if, if you, but for, the, for your benefit, there is, this is the kind of historiography um, that you can engage with um, if you're interested in this. You have um, uh, the, the work of um, largely American, American historians um, who have uh, written about the human rights revolution, people like Barbara Keyes, her very important book, Reclaiming American Virtue. Um, but these histories tend to write about human rights as American social history. What they're really interested in is how the issue of human rights shaped American society. Right? Why is it that Americans suddenly became concerned with human rights in the 1970s? They're not really interested in what the impact of that activism is on places like Iran. You know, what does human rights activism about Chile actually mean for Chile? What does human rights activism about Iran actually mean for Iran? They're not really interested in those questions. Um, uh, what they're more concerned with is, a, is, is really a, an American political debate about the sins of American foreign policy uh, or the omissions of American foreign policy. But it really, it's a debate about America and Americans. It's not really, it doesn't really tell you anything about Iran or Iranians or Greeks or Chileans or um, wh whoever else you're, you happen to be interested in. Um, that's very, you know, David Schmitz's book is a, is a sort of classic example of that. Um, um, and then you have work like mine, which does try to engage with Iran. Um, <coughs> it's my book there, but doesn't really uh, address social history, you know, which, which is something I, I sort of am, am very, um, I regret very much. And, and I didn't really try to address um, the social history of US-Iran relations in this book, and that's what's driving um, uh, my agenda now. Um, so. Let's start, where do we start? Uh, <coughs> if, you, if we want to understand how the notion of human rights be seeps into the Iranian revolution, we have to start really in, um, in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, the early 20th century in Iran, um, when for most Iranian intellectuals, for most of the Iranian political elite, um, the future of Iran was very much connected with the West uh, and Europe and the ideas of the European Enlightenment. You know, pretty much across the spectrum at the turn of the century in Iran, if you'd looked at, uh, you look at most of the Iranian intellectuals of the era, um, you look at what they're sort of saying and debating during the constitutional revolution in Iran, um, most are looking to the West uh, as the kind of lodestar as the model, as the uh, source um, for Iranian modernity. There's, you struggle, to, there are very few Iranian intellectuals who are looking east, who are looking to Asia. Um, most are interested in some sort of version of European modernity, whether it's Marxist, whether it's um, uh, liberal, uh, whatever version. And the, 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 um <coughs> the classic um, example is, is uh, 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 Hassan Taghizadeh. Taghizadeh, one of the great leaders of the um, uh, constitutional movement, who famously called on Iranians to embrace European civilization, you know, unconditionally. And that's an idea that's, that's extremely popular at that point um, in, in modern Iranian history. Um, and it, there is parallel to that. Th this is also the time when we can see that this narrative of civilization, of tamaddun, becomes very popular um, um, for Iranians. You have a whole series of, uh, um, um, of sort of early Iranian historians who <coughs> begin to develop the myth of Iran as a, as a sort of lost tribe of Europe, you know, 
the, the myth of Arianism, all of these ideas develop in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, <coughs> and what they all involve is a, essentially a rejection of the notion of Iran as an Islamic country. So it's trying to take Iran out of the sort of context of the Islamic Orient and instead to locate Iran within the um, European Occident, right? Um, and now, a lot of these ideas are not particularly original. They're, they're basically borrowed from European intellectuals of the 19th century. Um, <coughs> European ideas of nationalism are, are sort of um, borrowed and internalized um, by a lot of Iranian intellectuals. Um, but in essence, you have, <coughs> but by this point, um, there is, it's, I would say it's the period when sort of um, Iranians fall in love with the West and Westernism and the idea of being Western. Um, uh, and that idea, that notion of Iranian nationalism sort of continues into the mid 20th century until really until we get to the 1953 coup in Iran, the coup against Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, and what happens is that with the onset of the Cold War, and with the kind of trauma that, the, that this American and British-backed coup places on Iranians, there is a sort of falling out of love with the West. In other words, for a, for a whole generation of Iranians, younger Iranians, they begin to question this idea um, that really the values of the West, the liberalism, the values of the Enlightenment are, are where Iranians should look um, uh, for, for their future. There's a sort of undermining um, of, uh, uh, of that idea. And instead, a new generation begins to, you know, tries to look elsewhere. And in that sense, they're not very different to their counterparts really throughout the decolonizing third world. Uh, it, it, the beginning in the 1960s, the notion of a sort of return to an authentic Iranian self becomes very popular. And it's not an Iranian idea. It's a, it's an idea actually that <coughs> comes from Franz Fanon and The Wretched of the Earth, which I'm sure um, um, any of you are graduate students probably had to read at some point. I know I did. Um, so uh, in the Iranian iteration of that idea, it, it comes out through the work of Jalal al Ahmad and the notion of Qarb Zadigi, West toxification. Right? So the idea is that Iranians uh, who are looking to the West are West toxified. Um, they're seeking to emulate uh, the West and instead they should let go of that and they should embrace, they should return to some sort of authentic Iranian self. The problem is nobody knows what that is. Nobody knows what that authentic Iranian self is, right? So it has to be invented in some way, um, uh, uh, shape or form. But the, but the problem is that that rejection of the West, and here I'm going to take it back to human rights now. Thank you for your patience in this long preamble. The problem is when that rejection of um, Western liberalism be also means a rejection of the values that stand behind the notion of human rights. Right? And human rights, beginning in the 1960s, for many Iranian intellectuals, for many Iranian opposition figures, comes to be synonymous with sort of bourgeois liberalism. Right? Um, uh, instead, uh, what this new generation is, is, lo is looking for is not sort of reform, is not sort of moderate, um, moderate ideas of constitutionalism that, for example, Mossadegh represented. Instead, what they're looking for and looking towards are far more radical ideas far more uh, uh, militant ideas of revolution um, that, I that often, that sometimes involve an embrace of European modernity, for example, by, by Marxists, but also represent a total rejection of European modernity, for example, in the case of Ayatollah Khomeini and the, and the Islamists. Right? <coughs> and this is very important if you want to understand um, how and why they use the language of human rights to fight the Iranian Revolution. How can someone who fundamentally rejects the values and ideas that human rights is based on at the same time take up the banner of human rights in order to fight you know, a political cause or a revolution? Why would they do that? Well, they do that because they understand the potency, they understand the power of this idea of human rights right, in the context of the 1970s. Um, <coughs> 
Now, <clears throat> I think there's a, there's a, if you had to, um, uh, if you had to put your finger on a, on a specific moment um, when this uh, confrontation crystallizes, in my view, it's, it's in Berlin in the summer of 1967. Um, the, the, the Shah of Iran makes a state visit to Germany, to West Germany in 1967. Um, and he goes to Berlin <coughs> uh, where he's going to go to the opera. Uh, I think it's the Magic Flute, Mozart's Magic Flute. And um, outside, uh, Tens of thousands of Iranian students. Of course, there's a huge Iranian student population in Germany at the time. Uh, the Confederation of Iranian Students there, <coughs> in cooperation with German students, German student organizations, organized mass protests um, against the Shah. Uh, this photograph here is um, uh, uh, from those protests. Um, and uh, one of the German students, who, who, who wasn't actually protesting, he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, is, uh, is shot by a, a uh, undercover West German police officer. <coughs> and what happens is that that moment is when the German student movement is radicalized. The death of that, that student becomes the martyr of German student politics. And in fact, it's out of those demonstrations that the radical Red Army faction, the Beide Meinhof movement, begins. Um, Ulrike Meinhof, who was one of the leaders uh, uh, of the Red Army faction, had been very active in the opposition to the Shah. She was very good friends with uh, Bahman Yurumand and had written an open letter to Farah Pahlavi in one of the German papers and so on. So, uh, and it's similarly, it's the same moment when you can see the, the, the radicalization of the Iranian student movement. So the point I'm trying to make is that that's not happening purely in an Iranian context. These Iranian students are becoming radicalized in the global context as part of a transnational movement that's connected to German students. Um, and, and their struggle is not a, a struggle for constitutionalism in Iran or rights or anything like that. Rather, what they see themselves as is, is as the sort of Iranian front of a global struggle, of a global anti-imperial struggle. And their struggle is no different to that of the Chileans, to that of the Vietnamese, to that of the Palestinians, to that of the Algerians, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? That's the context you have to understand the beginning, I think, the, begin the beginnings of the Iranian Revolution. It's that global anti imperial um, uh, struggle. Yet, um, uh, they also understand, particularly uh, here in the United States, they understand the power of the uh, uh, human rights rhetoric. Why? Because it's a time when the United States is embroiled in the Vietnam War. Uh, it's a time of Watergate. It's an era when um, the Cold War consensus is breaking down. There is a global youth counterculture that's rising. Um, and they understand that they can use that uh, as a battering ram against the Shah's regime. In other words, the sense of guilt that many Americans felt for Vietnam could be projected onto Iran because of the American role in the 1953 coup, and they could make sense of that. That is why they're embracing the rhetoric of human rights. Right? It doesn't come from some sort of um, deep commitment to liberal values of, um, uh, of, of human rights. Um, so this, this combination of, of, on the one hand, Arab um, Zadigi, return to an authentic Iranian self. On the other hand, um, activism uh, 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 and, and a shaming of the Shah's regime on its human rights rhetoric. This is a very powerful and effective strategy for confronting the Pahlavi state. And, um, and the Shah and, and the Pahlavi elite never really managed to come up with a convincing answer um, uh, to this critique, to this Qarab Zadiki critique. They do try. They do try to develop an official ideology, um, but it is incredibly contradictory and convoluted, and, and, but I'm gonna take you through it anyway. Um, <coughs> what they do is they come up with, um, with, with, with something that I would call Pahlavi third worldism. Um, 
what this essentially um, represents, you know, is an attempt to co-opt the language of Qarb Zadigi, right? The, to attempt to create an official answer to the question of how do we return to an authentic Iranian self? What is that authentic Iranian self? Um, it, it's actually codified in the late 1960s. You can, there's actual books published with titles like Pahlavism, you know, which takes you through the official ideology um, of the state. And it revolves around, first of all, the White Revolution. Um, so the series of reforms that were introduced by, the, sh by um, the, the Shah in 1963, later was referred to as the Revolution of the Shah and the People. Um, and that's the first plank of Pahlavism. The idea of this great civilization basically as a super welfare state that would provide for all the needs um, uh, of the Iranian people. But there's also a global projection of Pahlavism. So it's not just about what the state can provide in terms of material benefits to Iranians. It's about explaining to Iranians who they are and where they belong in the world and also projecting to the world um, that identity. Uh, and uh, that is best encapsulated. If you, want to, if you want to try to have a mental picture of what that looks like, it's best encapsulated by the Persepolis celebrations in 1971, uh, which was, you know, the Persepolis celebrate. they're much ridiculed and they were a source of tremendous sort of negative publicity for the Pahlavi regime. But if, you know, for a moment you take them seriously as a propaganda um, exercise, they were trying to project a specific narrative of civilization to the world. Why, for example, it, it, it's, they were like, uh, the way I would describe them is, imagine hosting an Olympic Games without the sport. So you just have the opening ceremony, you know, right? We had it in, in, in Britain a few years ago, and the, and the opening ceremony made absolutely no sense to anybody who wasn't English. You know, they had the, something about, <laughs> about the NHS, and you know, and. Uh, I, I really think there was some, something comparable there. It, why the message that was being broadcast from Persepolis to the world in 1971 was the idea that not only that Iran had arrived, so not only that Iran is this great power that must be respected, but that Iran had returned. Right? It's, you know, there's a reason why that spectacle was held at Persepolis. Right? Uh, it's a, it's a, the idea of a resurrection of Iranian greatness, of Iranian empire, essentially. There's an imperial kind of subtext there. Um, and that was supposed to be a source of pride for Iranians, and it was supposed to project an image to the world of, um, of confidence uh, and power um, as opposed to dependence um, uh, 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 and weakness. Um, of course, it completely, it, it was entirely undermined by the fact that very few Iranians were actually invited to participate in the celebrations, and that all of the expense uh, of the celebration went on essentially providing French food and um, lavish sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, French finery um, for, for the Shah's international guests. But if you put that aside for just a moment and you, th and you think about what was actually happening there, there was the Shah of Iran at the very center of the global stage. I mean, virtually all the leaders of the third world, all the, pretty much all the leaders of the communist world, and most of the leaders of the Western world were, were there. And there was the Shah of Iran in the center of it all. You know? And that was a pretty powerful image um, uh, to project to the world. Um, in fact, I think it's almost unprecedented in Iranian history to think of another Iranian leader who could assemble um, that number of world leaders in Iran, you know, and project that level of um, uh, uh, prestige, essentially, um, uh, to the world. Uh, but in any case, this ideology of Pahlavism, this notion of the great civilization, the Tamadun of Azurg, was also uh, uh, devoid of any form of liberalism. It also rejected um, the notion of human rights, um, uh, because in the Shah's view, and he, sa he said it repeatedly throughout the 1970s, he very much um, took the view, uh, as did, by the way, many conservatives in the West, that Western civilization was in decline. Um, and you, if you watch the Shah's interviews from the time, you can see that he actually takes great pleasure 
in, um, in berating Western journalists by saying that, well, you know, you, he, he would refer to the West as the permissive society and say that, well, if you continue in this way, you know, your, your society is going to blow up, essentially. It's the same argument that American conservatives made, that, you know, American culture is in decline, that American youth are all on drugs, and America has essentially lost its um, sense of moral purpose. Um, so, in other words, you have, an op you have a state and an opposition, neither of which um, is particularly enamored of liberalism. In fact, both of which reject liberalism. But what's interesting is that yet both of them want to adopt a narrative of human rights. I, I told you about the opposition's narrative of human rights. Well, the Shah had his own narrative of human rights. And um, it took shape in Tehran in 1968 at the UN International Conference on Human Rights, which Iran hosted. It, was, it marked the 20th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and the, narr the, the narrative of human rights that emerged there in Tehran in 1968 uh, was what most historians call a third world narrative of human rights, which basically says political and civil rights are all well and good, but they're kind of meaningless unless you enjoy sovereignty, unless you achieve the first right, which is self-determination. Right? Um, uh, in other words, it's a post-colonial notion of human rights. And it's a notion of, of, of rights, really, that emphasizes the rights of the state, not the rights of the individual. Yeah, that, that the rights of the state are more important than the rights of the individual. Um, uh, and that's a very convenient narrative for the Shah. That's a very convenient understanding of human rights um, from his point of view. And then he projects on top of that the idea of Pahlavism by saying that actually the first charter of human rights in history is the Cyrus Cylinder you know, of Cyrus the Great. Right? And it actually, and the Cyrus Cylinder, which I mean, everybody is familiar with, becomes the actual symbol of the 2,500 year um, anniversary celebrations of, of Persepolis. You know. um, this is completely anachronistic. Um, I don't think you'll, you'll find any ancient historian that will agree that, <laughs> that the very, very modern concept of human rights can be projected back onto the Achaemenid Empire. Um, but, it, but, but in any case, um, uh, this is a, uh, this is, it's interesting that nonetheless the Pahlavi state feels the need to develop its own narrative of human rights. So in other words, the human rights is becoming the contested terrain of Iranian politics between both the opposition um, and the state. And the, and the state invests a great deal of energy and a great deal of resources in this. Um, the Shah's twin sister, Princess Ashraf, becomes the chairman of the UN Human Rights Commission. Um, she uh, becomes a very prominent figure in the sort of international human rights sphere. Um, she attends the, she's actually one of the organizers of the 1975 uh, women's rights, UN Women's Rights Conference in Mexico City. Um, and she becomes a very prominent figure and advocate of this third world notion of human rights. The idea that um, self-determination, that social and economic rights precede civil and political rights. Um, and it's part of this by the way, this human rights agenda is also part of a, an entire kind of third worldist project. Um, it's an attempt on the part uh, uh, of the Shah's regime to project an image um, of the Shah as a third world leader. You know. In other words, as a third world nationalist. Because of course, the figure of Mossadegh looms in the background, you know, looms over the Shah, and he can never really crawl out from underneath it. So he wants to project this image of himself as a third world nationalist. Um, and he does it on a whole series of issues, not just human rights. And most prominent is, is, of course, the issue of oil and oil prices. You know, the Shah projects a very powerful image of himself as the defender of the rights of oil producing countries against the oil consuming West. But he also does it on a, on a whole series of other issues. Iran, for example, is one of the sponsors in 1974 of the very famous new international economic order resolution at the UN General Assembly. And, and, it, and there you have Pahlavi Iran lined up with Algeria and Venezuela, you know, not natural sort of political allies. And yet they find themselves 
working together to, to push forward this kind of third world economic agenda at the UN. Similarly, on the issue of nuclear proliferation uh, and nuclear technology, uh, the Shah speak, you know, pushes the agenda of um, proliferation of nuclear technology to the third world, you know, in opposition to the control of nuclear technology by the Western countries. Yeah. Um, there's a whole series. Uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict, the issue of the Arab-Israeli conflict throughout the 1970s, the Shah moves closer and closer to the Arab position, to the moderate Arab position, particularly President Sadat, right, and moves further and further away from the Israelis. Um, uh, so you can see that th this is all part of a, 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 an effort to project an image of independence and of strength uh, to counter this narrative of qab zadigi, of weakness and of dependence, right? And human rights is a very important part of that um, contested terrain. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about um, Amnesty International. The, 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 uh, why, uh, you know, Amnesty International plays a very important part in the mobilization of human rights as a weapon by the Iranian opposition against the Shah. And they do so, for the most part, rather unwittingly. Okay. I'm not here to make the case that Amnesty International is responsible for the Iranian Revolution. Okay, please don't. <laughs> that shouldn't be your takeaway from this lecture. Far from it. Um, but what I, what I do find interesting, and, and the argument that I would make, is that Amnesty International plays a role in essentially legitimizing the human rights claims of the Iranian opposition. Right? Whereas those sort of criticisms of the Shah's regime, when they're coming from the Iranian student movement, when they're coming from Iranian political figures, can be dismissed. Um, uh, they can't be so easily ignored when they're coming from uh, an organization like Amnesty International, which had a tremendous amount of um, moral uh, ca capital, essentially, in the 1970s. Of course, they win the Nobel Peace Prize um, in 1977. So, you know, this is, a, this is the important role that they play. Um, Amnesty had been focused on Iran since the early 1960s, and nobody really paid very much attention to what they were doing. Essentially, what they would do is adopt political prisoners in Iran and get members of amnesty groups uh, around the world, mainly in northern Europe, to write letters to the Iranian government calling for the release of these, of these prisoners. And that kind of strategy was not really very effective. It didn't get very far. Um, one problem they had is actually identifying political prisoners, which was quite difficult for amnesty. Because amnesty, one of the principles of amnesty is that they don't embrace a political prisoner who's used violence, who's been violent in any way. Um, and that was very problematic, difficult to ascertain when it came to many of the Iranian um, uh, political prisoners and dissidents. Um, and also, it was just very difficult for Amnesty's researchers to actually get into Iran and to be able to talk to people, to be able to do the basic research which they needed to do. So this wasn't a very effective strategy. Um, this all changes in the 1970s. It, it, um, it changes because Amnesty switches tactics. It moves away from letter writing and it moves towards the idea of essentially publicizing human rights abuses in Iran through reports like this one. This was the first report dedicated specifically to um, human rights abuses um, in Iran uh, uh, in the late 1970s. But this is a far more effective strategy. And, and really what, they, what happens is that these reports begin to seep into the press. They begin to seep into press reports on Iran. You can see that from the mid-1970s onwards. The narrative prior to that in the press had really been one of you know, the Shah as the great modernizer, um, the white revolution, you know, Iran as this modernizing country. But beginning in the sort of early 1970s, late 60s, early 1970s, you'll see that in the articles in the British press, in the American press, the French press, the German press, there will also be a paragraph that maybe talks about human rights abuses, quoting um, uh, one of these um, amnesty reports. Now, I, the amnesty has an archive, if any of you are interested, in Amsterdam. The Amnesty International Archive is there. And it's fascinating to go into that archive and look at the documents on Iran. Uh, I was very surprised to see that the Amnesty researchers were very conscious of the fact that the Iranian opposition wanted to use them 
for their own political purposes. And that they tried very hard to prevent that from happening. But it was very difficult for them to do, do that because, of course, their primary source of information for the human rights situation in Iran were Iranian political dissidents, uh, the Confederation of Iranian Students, and so on. So they faced this constant dilemma of how to collect information on what was happening in Iran and present it in an unbiased way, um, while at the same time having to rely for the Iranian opposition for that very information. Um, and it all came to a, one episode which kind of detailed this very uncomfortable relationship between Amnesty and the Iranian opposition was in 1970. And in, in, in 1970, the... Um, uh, uh, I think it was actually the Austrian, um, or no, it was the Germ German amnesty section sent a professor, uh, uh, a man by the name of Hans Heldman, he was a law professor, uh, to Tehran to try to observe um, one of the trials uh, that was going on at the time. Um, and uh, he, Heldman had had a long-standing relationship with the Confederation of Iranian Students. And he took with him as a translator a young, young Iranian student um, by the name of Hossein Rezaei. Um, uh, and uh, when Heldman went to Tehran, uh, before he could really do very much, um, uh, he was picked up by Savak and he was deported um, out of Iran and all his material was confiscated. But Rezaei was arrested and imprisoned in Iran and it quickly became apparent that Rezaei was actually a member of the Confederation for Iranian Students. And this po posed a huge problem for Amnesty because it completely undermined Amnesty's claims to being politically independent. I mean, if they are using an actual member of the Iranian opposition to carry out their research in Iran, you know, it undermines um, their claims. And, and it caused a massive sort of introspection within Amnesty um, as to what to do about this. And they produced, they c the, now part, part of the reason this happened was that the, you have to understand the national sections of amnesty are somewhat autonomous from the international secretariat of the organization. They certainly were back in the 1970s when it was a fairly amateur organization. Um, what I found really interesting was that Amnesty, what, the, what Amnesty did is they commissioned an internal report on the Iranian opposition. Uh, and this report, I have to say, was one of the most insightful and sort of prescient studies of the Iranian opposition in the 1970s that, that, I've, that I've seen. It was more accurate in its understanding of the Iranian opposition than anything being produced by the US State Department or the CIA or anywhere else. It was incredible. And basically what the report said was that we have to be very careful in our relationship with the Iranian opposition because the Iranian opposition has no real, no sincere belief in the notion of human rights. And they want to complete, they want to use human rights as an in instrumentally. And it went through systematically the various different Iranian opposition groups. Um, uh, uh, and interestingly said, and you have to keep in mind, this is the early 1970s. Uh, it said, you know, the, the, the group that is most likely um, to come out on top is Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamists. And they are the least committed to the notion of human rights of any of the Iranian um, opposition <coughs> groups. You know. And this is in the early 1970s, you know, which I found absolutely remarkable. Um, but it, it goes to show um, that uh, you know, the, the freedom to be able to say what you want, to argue what you want, is probably more important than actual access to classified you know, information and secret contacts, you know, which many of these um, government officials would have had. In any case, um, this kind of amnesty activism picks up throughout the 1970s. This focus on human rights in Iran, particularly the issue of torture. Torture becomes, amnesty has a specific campaign on torture beginning in 1973. And that is what really takes uh, Iran and the Shah to the center stage of human rights activism. Until then, Iran hadn't really been one of the really big, big um, campaigns in terms of human rights. It, it didn't have the same status, for example, that Chile had, or Greece, or many of the other um, uh, uh, movements, human rights movements. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We can discuss that later. I have my. I think part of the fact was that you have to imagine for a European audience, for an American audience, their set of expectations about human rights in Iran was far lower uh, 
than their expectations for a European country like Greece. In other words, the idea of sort of terrible human rights abuses in Iran was not considered anything sort of unusual. And really, if we're speaking historically, it wasn't that unusual. You know, the, the Shah's regime was not the first Iranian, Iranian government or ruler to abuse the human rights of its citizens. It's something fairly well established in, in, in Iranian history. So, uh, but what happens is that the, the stories of torture that um, the sort of testimony, the witnessing of torture by Iranian dissidents in the West, people like Reza Barahini and others, bring vividly you know, brings this issue to the fore um, and really garners, a, you know, places Iran as one of the kind of preeminent human rights issues um, for a lot of human rights activists in the West, not just Iranians, but all kinds of activists and all kinds of... Um, uh, groups um, and it's not just Amnesty doing this kind of activism there's a whole series of sort of non-governmental organizations such as the International Commission for Jurists the, uh, uh, there's a whole sort of slew of them but Amnesty is certainly the most um, um, prominent who are uh, uh, bringing to the attention of Europeans and Americans and others you know, the, the human rights abuses going on um, uh, in Iran now, uh, the point I want to make is this is not an agenda that's being driven by American and European elites. This, is, this human rights agenda is being driven from below. This is ordinary people. Um, and what's really quite fascinating is that when you actually talk to the, if you talk to a lot of these human rights activists from the 70s, they're often people who had no political involvement whatsoever prior to the 1970s. They weren't particularly you know, politicized people, but um, what happens is that because of this human rights revolution of the 1970s, they become uh, politicized into you know, what some historians have described, you know, some have described this kind of human rights activism as a kind of secular religion. You, know, you can think of it that way. Um, uh, Samuel Moyne, who some of you will know is a very um, uh, well-known historian of human rights, has sort of talked about human rights activism. He calls it the last utopia. Right? In an era of the 1970s when a lot of other, uh, when religion, socialism, you know, a, lo a lot of other sort of movements that you could have been a part of had sort of lost their appeal for a whole variety of reasons, human rights stood out as an opportunity to sort of be part of something greater than yourself. Um, for a lot of ordinary people in Europe and um, in the United States. Um, it's certainly not an agenda that's being driven by Jimmy Carter, contrary to the popular narrative. Um, in fact, in the 1976 presidential election between Carter and Ford, Carter doesn't say anything about human rights in Iran. He only mentions Iran, to my knowledge, once, and that's in the second presidential debate. That's where this photo is from. The second presidential debate in which he's asked a question about Iran. And his answer, uh, he, he essentially says, um, the United States is selling too many arms to Muslim countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia and not selling enough weapons to Israel. And that's it. That's pretty much all he says about Iran in that, um, in that election. But the perception by the Iranian opposition, by the Shah himself, by Iranian political elites, pretty much all, you know, across the board, is that um, Carter, is if he wins the election, he's going to make human rights in Iran a very important issue, and he's going to make it essentially a condition of a continuing relationship with the United States. Um, that's certainly the perception of the Shah. Because, of course, Carter is talking about human rights in the general sense, um, but not um, uh, uh, specifically um, in the case of Iran. What's very interesting is that right after this presidential debate, the Shah does his very famous interview with Mike Wallace, which you've probably all seen. It's on, it's on YouTube, um, in which he makes these comments about um, the New York Times being controlled by the Jews and um, and if you want to understand why he makes those comments, it's, I, th I think it's in, the it's in the context of this debate. It's in, this con it's in the context of this perception the Shah has that there is a pro-Israeli, anti-Iranian um, agenda at play in this election. Right. Um, 
In any case, at the same time as this election is going on, this report by Amnesty International is published in November of 1976. So you can understand how in the mind of the Iranian opposition, in the mind of the Shah, in this human rights battle, in the context of this presidential election, the perception is that the Shah is losing and the opposition is winning. Right? That the agenda is shifting against the Shah and in favor of his, um, of his critics. And that's, I think, um, not an accident. You know, it's, it's, um, the release of this report, I think, at that time was designed to garner maximum attention. Um, and it's no accident that it would be released right in the middle of a presidential election when a presidential candidate is talking so much about, um, about human rights. It's hard to imagine an American presidential election where human rights was the, was the main issue. But in any case, um, the Pahlavi state and the Shah respond to this by, um, by hiring a, 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 a PR specialist, a man called um, Yankelevich, Daniel Yankelevich. Um, you can read about this in Alam's um, diaries. Um, they hire this, um, this lobbyist, K Street lobbyist, who's recommended to them by the Israelis. Uh, uh, of course, th it was in the mindset of the Shah, of course, that the, you know, the, the pro-Israel lobby, the Jewish lobby, has so much power in Washington, and therefore, you know, they're the best people to ask for, for advice on how to manipulate American politics. So they ask the Israelis for advice, and the Israelis recommend Yankelevich. And Yankelevich does a pretty good job. You know, he goes and um, writes a very comprehensive and frank report um, and says, you know, you, you have a problem with your human rights image in the West and um, there's a, these are the perceptions of Iran and so forth. And if you read Alam's diaries, you can see that the Shah is absolutely furious. He's absolutely furious when he reads this report. He says, what is this nonsense? Does this guy not understand what we've been doing in this country for the last... 15 years? Does he not understand what the White Revolution was about? Does he not understand the reforms that we've enacted? You know? um, and he basically just doesn't want to hear it. Um, uh, what he does do, however, and I think it's in direct response to this, um, and in partly there are other issues as well, what he does do is, of course, launch the liberalization, right? the Shah's political liberalization in 1977, which some people dismiss as you know a fake liberalization but there's a considerable amount of evidence that it really did have an impact as far as human rights were concerned the you know the conditions in iranian prisons did substantially change physical torture stopped um, and if you read the, the International Commission for, uh, for the Red Cross, which came in and inspected Iran's prisons in 1977-78, they did report on quite significant um, changes that had, take, that had taken place in prison conditions in Iran. Why would the Shah do that? Well, my argument is because of the activism of groups like Amnesty. It was, it, it was this grassroots movement in Europe and the United States, ordinary Americans, ordinary Europeans, putting human rights in Iran on the agenda that put that pressure on the Shah. Um, yes, it was certainly important that you had a presidential election in which the winning candidate was talking about human rights, certainly. Um, but there was no direct pressure from Carter. It was, it was pressure that came from American and European society. And what did that pressure really say? What were they really saying when they were criticizing the human rights record of the Shah? What they were saying is that Iran is not the great civilization, right? that Iranians are not civilized because civilized countries don't behave in this way. They don't torture their own people. They don't have political prisons. That is, by definition, uncivilized behavior. Right? And I think it's because of that, rather than any kind of political pressure, rather than any fear of you know, um, curtailing arms sales to Iran, I think it's really that, that uh, deep desire uh, on the part of the Shah and on the part of the Pahlavi state to project this image of civilized Iran, of a return to a great civilization. That's driving that liberalization project. You know, that, that is an image, that liberalization is an, Im is an attempt to essentially buttress and hold up that great civilization image in the face of this barrage of criticism that's coming from the grassroots of European and American society. Um, 
Uh, and of course, that, what does that liberalization project result in? Well, it's not perceived as civilized behavior by the Iranian opposition. It's perceived as weakness. It emboldens the Iranian opposition um, and really is the kind of can, you know, the, the match that lights the flame of the Iranian revolution. It begins the whole process of open criticism, open revolt against the Pahlavi state that mushrooms into mass demonstrations throughout 1978. So, uh, yeah, this is my my liberalization slide here. Um, uh, we know that uh, that 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 Parvi Sabati, the, the head of the um, internal security for Savak, there he is uh, on the right there. Um, we know that the sh that he warned the Shah against this liberalization project. He warned the Shah that. You know, launching a liberalization project in 1977 is a disastrous idea um, because of the uh, mass urbanization that had taken place in Iran, because of the social and economic problems that existed in Iran's urban centers, because of the very large student populations in Iran, that all of this was a recipe for revolution. But according to Sabati, the, the Shah completely ignores his advice and says to him, oh, you don't understand the progress that we've made. You know, this is not 1963, this is 1977. Right? Iran has changed. Right? Um, poor old Jimmy Carter, you know, who is trying desperately to uh, fight this perception that he is somehow undermining the Shah's regime. What does he do? He invites the Shah to the United States for a state visit. Um, the Shah comes in November of 1977. Um, but what happens? There are mass protests in Washington, D.C., in front of the White House. Um, the Washington, D.C. police fire tear gas at the demonstrators. The tear gas wafts across the lawn of the White House. And the image that's broadcast to the whole world is of the Shah with tears streaming down his face, you know, being publicly humiliated um, by Jimmy Carter. Um, on the White House lawn. I've seen the, tra if you, you can read the transcript of the conversation that took place right after this happened when they go into the Oval Office. And the first thing that Jimmy Carter says to the, to the Shah is, I'm so sorry, Your Majesty, <laughs> sort of profusely apologizes to him, you know, for this sort of public embarrassment. But this, I think, sums up, this image, I think, perfectly sums up the a question of human rights and the Iranian Revolution. You know, the unintended consequences of making human rights such a prominent issue um, in the 1970s. Here's a president that didn't want to undermine the Shah, that wanted to do everything possible to um, uh, support the Shah's uh, government. But instead, just by raising the specter of human rights in a general way, you know, not even specifically referring to Iran, because of that activism that had taken place by organizations like Amnesty, literally brings the Shah to tears. Anyway, I think I should stop there and I've spoken for quite a while and um, take any questions you might have.